This episode is a sort of two-parter, but you can listen in either order. They're both about the Aeolian harp, which is a musical instrument played entirely by the wind with no human contact. They're called How to Build an Aeolian Harp and Why to Build an Aeolian Harp. And just a reminder, if you like the show, make sure to subscribe. All right, here we go. The wind. With Phil Corbett. kind of off the grid, and um, neither of these is a real phone. They're both um, tethered to satellite. I spoke to John Luther Adams via satellite phone, both of us sitting outside on a windy day, which, of course, is not ideal for audio quality, but I think it's worth listening to anyway. So pardon the wind noise through the phone. Plus, it did seem kind of fitting for the topic. If you aren't familiar with his work, John Luther Adams is a composer who's won a Pulitzer Prize, a Grammy, and of course, more importantly, has created an immense catalog of beautiful, otherworldly music. Actually, strike that. I think it's the opposite of otherworldly. It is intensely of this world. His music tends to translate huge elemental forces into harmonic pieces for percussion, voice, and orchestral instruments, mainly. For this episode, I've decided to play our phone call almost in full, edited lightly for clarity and interspersed with a couple long musical interludes. So, here's my call with John Luther Adams. How how is everything going? How are you doing? Doing well, thanks. How about yourself? I'm doing good too. Um, it's a really beautiful day right now. It's November, you know, in the Sierra, so all the all the leaves are turned, and it's yeah, it's really nice out right now. What are your uh, What are your temperatures like? Uh, you know, right now it's about forty degrees. I think a high of like forty six today or something, and then. You know, we're getting down into the 20s at night, um, sometimes into the teens. But, yeah, it's been mm-hmm. pretty comfortable. What's your What's your elevation, Phil? Uh, I'm at 7,500 feet. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we're much farther south, and we're at about 6,000. And um, it's, you know, last year at this time we had snow, and right now I'm I'm sitting outside in the sunshine, you know, and it maybe it's got to be in the low, low 70s. Oh, wow. So pretty warm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so tell me about what you're doing. Basically, I am, so I make this show called The Wind, and it's a podcast and radio show. And I basically, I just built a desk out in the woods a couple miles from my house and come out here and do interviews and just try to kind of research sound in new ways and and think try to think of music and music journalism um kind of as a as an experience of listening deeper and yeah just kind of trying to get out of the studio i guess well when molly sent me your message i i thought your inquiry your invitation i thought well this is just um offbeat enough to to be intriguing i'm not saying no to 
to a lot of interviews these days, but there is just something about what you're doing that um, that appealed to me that caught my imagination. So here we are. Cool. That's really cool to hear. Um, so yeah, as far as this episode goes, um, it is kind of a uh, dive into the Aeolian harp, and I was kind of thinking of it as a how and why to build a harp. Um, and I've been trying to, to build them. I'm still definitely a novice. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to kind of, you know, tell other people kind of what they are, what they do and kind of figure out why I've been compelled to try to build these things. And you seemed like the perfect person to ask. Well, I understand why you're compelled. They're magical. I mean, why? What, what do you think that, what is so magical about them? Well, it's, it's an instrument that allows us to pull the music directly out of the air. It just, the music comes down out of the sky and um, across the strings of the instrument and into our ears and, um, and, and down through our bodies and into the earth. Uh, my, I've never built an Aeolian harp. But much of my life's work has been um, shaped by my experiences listening to Aeolian harps, and in particular, one small harp that I carried all over the tundra, the forests, the mountains, the glaciers of Alaska, listening to the winds for, for years. And uh, part of the magic, I think, Phil, is that, um, you know, it opens up the harmonic series, which is all around us all the time. You might say it's it's the breath of the world, but uh, we rarely hear the harmonic series um, alone, it's usually deeply embedded in the breath of the world, in the in 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 the sounds all around us, most of which are noise. And when I say noise, you know, I'm speaking of noise, not not in the vernacular sense of unwanted sound, but I'm talking about complex, aperiodic sound, um, which, as John Cage observed, you know, many many years ago, is um, is most of what we hear around us all the time. So with these magical harps, we can um, can 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 filter the breath of the world, uh, the wind, and and hear the harmonic series r- revealed um, in all its in in all its miraculous um, uh, glory. I I I think of it as. Um, Almost like um, uh, you know, you put a you put a harp on your head and and stand into the wind and uh, the, uh, the 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 pink noise. You might say the white light of the world crosses the strings, and it's almost like a prism. Um, and, and 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 the wind goes across the strings, and it and it breaks into all these um, beautiful harmonic um, colors, this, this oral prism of sound. Yeah, it's really interesting that you, that you use the word filter, because I think that that's, that's kind of what I've been trying to figure out is what, what are these things? Like, are they translators? Are they, you know, is it something that is creating its own sonic world? And it seems like it's not you know, it, it's so dependent on the wind and the velocity of the wind that it is translating something. And I, I like the idea of a filter, that it's kind of filtering the sound that is passing through it into a type of sound that we can, you know, kind of understand better. Well, I use that again, uh, that, you know, that, that, that word filter almost as a, an acoustician would use it, right? I mean, if, if, if you take um, wind as a kind of colored noise, um, you know, the, the, um, the hypothetical version of that, the synthetic version of, of, of noise is um, um, 
the, the most clinical version of, of, of synthetic noise is, is, of course, white noise, in which theoretically all the frequencies that we can hear are present in equal energy in a random, uh, rapid fire, random fashion. So essentially it's all the sounds that we can hear in the air all at once. And as, as you know, the wind obviously is, is already filtered by, by trees and by rocks and by grasses and, and, and by water and by bird feathers and, and, and whatever else is passing through, uh, by your hair, by your ears. Um, but it is, it is, a, I think, a, a kind of a beautiful filter. Uh, another way of, of um, through through which we can hear the inner the inner uh, life of 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 the wind. Um, another way of, of describing it, I guess, would be uh, an alien harp. I, I is a is a transducer, right? Like a microphone or or a loudspeaker is, I guess, uh, a loudspeaker. I guess transducers can go either way. They can send or receive signals. But uh, my relationship to the alien harp has been as a way to extend the reach of my ears to allow me to hear things that I couldn't otherwise hear, at least not so clearly. And um, so it's a receiving, it's a receiving transducer, and then. So am I. I become a receiver, and um, that music passes from the wind through the harp into my body, my ears, my imagination, and then eventually it comes back out as as the wind in high places, or as Sila, the breath of the world, or so many other uh, uh, pieces of, of, of my music over the of the last four decades. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to come back to a couple of those. I think I, w- I would, before I get carried away, I would like to ask you specifically about your Aeolian sound world. It, it's, it's funny because I'm working on two pieces right now, uh, mixing two recordings, one of, of a piece that's now several years old, and, uh, and then another recording uh, I'm working on of, of brand new pieces. And, um, and, and, and both of these grow out of my experiences listening to wind harps, listening to Aeolian harps. Um, the new piece actually goes back to the place it all began, which was um, standing on the tundra in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, um, where my beloved Cynthia and I were had our wedding ceremony in 1989, and making my very first recording of Aeolian harps. And... Um, I remember I would I would put the harp on my head. I, this is a harp that that I still own. It's maybe um, two and a half, three feet wide, about nine or ten inches tall, and you know, ten or eleven inches um, wide. It has two string courses. They're nylon strings. It's a beautiful little instrument that was made by my friend Robert Cunningham wonderful instrument builder. And, um, you know, it was small enough that I could throw it into a backpack and hike off across the tundra. And it was small enough that I could stand out there, hold the thing on my head, and dance like a weather vane in the wind. Hmm. Yeah. So I could, you know, turn from side to side um, with the wind. I could tilt the harp slightly up or down to to catch as much of the wind as I could. And to add to the magic, though, was, of course, this music coming out of the sky across the strings of the harp, down through my skull and and, and through my body right back, right back into the earth. So I became, in that sense, a kind of resonator uh, for the music of the wind. Anyway, I started making recordings. This would have been uh, late June, early July in 1989. And we had uh, a stretch of unusually uh, perfect weather 
there in the in the foothills of the Brooks Range and the Arctic Coastal Plain. And I had three or four days of just ideal conditions in which there was a light breeze, light and variable breeze from different directions, but um, never overwhelming, and the harp was just singing so sweetly. So I, I made some recordings with all the strings tuned to the same tone, tuned in unison. I can't remember how many strings there are in each of the string courses, but maybe a dozen or so on each side, because as you know, it requires a certain critical mass of um, turbulent air, um, of vortex shedding uh, across the string for for a harp to to be able to sing. It, it has to have enough disturbed air circulating um, for it to emit tone to get to get the to get the strings um, singing with the harmonic series. Anyway, I made recordings of of unisons, and then. I um I got the idea, well, let me let me tune one side to a different pitch. So I, I knelt down on the tundra and I tuned one side to G and the other side to B. And I put the stood back up to the harp on my head and this whole new world of harmonic, melodic, uh, musical colors opened up for me. And I've been exploring that world ever since. We'll be back in a few minutes after this excerpt of The Wind in High Places by John Luther Adams.
really touches me about your music is that it it just always sounds like this unexpected dispatch for me from like a kind of like this world between human and non-human like it just sounds so elemental and thank you (laughs) sure i mean yeah just big in ways that you don't hear people sound and so I guess that's that's what I'm wondering is like, do you see yourself as, you know, a a translator of these elemental forces? Is that your role? Um, that's a fair question, and um, maybe so. But really, the honest truth, Phil, is that this is what I need. You know, like all of us who live in this fragmented, crumbling contemporary society, I long, you know, in my heart, my mind, and my spirit to to be in touch with something older, deeper, more mysterious than um than than my own troubles and um the the travails and foibles of of, of human society. This is what I need for my for myself, and you know I hope that that out of that comes music that is um, you know somehow useful and meaningful to to other people who are feeling something similar in this crazy world that we that we we humans have created for ourselves. You know, what keeps me going now, what am I, I'm, I'll be 69 before long. What keeps me going is my love for my faith in the next generations. Uh, my generation has failed miserably as custodians of the earth and, and custodians of our own humanity. I I hope only to leave something that may be of use to to younger people who will have to sort through the rubble that my generation is leading to them and um, imagine and bring about new ways of, of, of living together with one another and with, with other with all other forms of life on this on this beautiful planet which, you know, is the only home that that most of us will ever know. You're music so often deals with time in a really interesting way and deals with ideas of of very sprawling time spaces i guess is the way i'd put Mm -hmm. it is that a conscious decision yeah most of my music is i guess slow but you know then there are pieces um particularly in my percussion music um uh, the strange and sacred noise would be a, a piece I'd point you to. Uh, some of that is very, very fast, and <clears throat> at a certain point, the lines kind of blur. Hmm. I've just finished what I swear <laughs> will be my final orchestral piece, and it's called an Atlas of Deep Time. And um, I've been I've been reading the rocks. I've been reading a lot of of Earth history and geology and trying to learn uh, to decipher geologic maps, to decipher the hundreds of millions of years of of history beneath my feet on this this mountain where I live. This new piece is 46 minutes long. So it's it's, it's a sprawling orchestral piece on, on a scale similar to Become Ocean or Become Desert. But the tempo marking is uh, 100 million years per minute, hmm. right? <laughs> because the piece is 46 minutes long, and of course the Earth is, as far as we can figure, Masa Menos, um, four billion six hundred million years old. This is really fast music, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. <laughs> That, that's cool. And where where is that? When, like when that comes out, where is it gonna be? I will see you um, on April thirtieth in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Okay, I'll be there. 
Yeah, I'm excited about it. But uh, you know, I swear this is it. I'm 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 done. <laughs> I'm done with orchestra music. <laughs> You know, because Phil, I you know what I said earlier, right? I I really um, you know I I, I want to throw in with uh, with the society that I want to live in, which I'll probably never live to inhabit. You know, classical music is is. A, uh, a profound expression of the height of, of, you know, of a society, of a culture that is gone. We'll be back after this few minute excerpt of the piece Become Desert. Anything I do from here on, I want to somehow be um, be part of, of of the society that that I imagine will will follow. Part of the new culture that uh, younger people like you and and, and and kids who are just coming up, just coming of age now, will create. That's yeah, that's really exciting. Just the way you said that is that that's something that you know, makes me want to be a part of it too, whatever it is. Well, it's clear that you are a part of it. And, and I get, you know, um, I think we're all struggling with, um, uh, at least most of us are, are, are struggling these days with being discouraged. I mean, it just seems like there are so many things wrong. And the, the, the way forward just seems unclear. And yet, 
I meet I meet kids, you know, teenagers, twenty um, somethings, who are determined that um, that they're going to make things right, and that gives me the courage to uh, to keep doing whatever I can do to help. What are you listening to lately? I know you said you're working a lot and mixing, but is there? Are you listening to anything outside of that? No, um, you know the, the 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 unvarnished truth is that I rarely listen to music. Hmm, sure. Um, because of course, my life's work is to hear something that hasn't been heard before, uh, or to imagine that and, and, and to try to hear it and then bring it into the air so that so that it can be heard. When I was younger, I was a voracious listener. And then uh, yeah, I just, we just listened to music all the time and, and, and all kinds of music. And, and, you know, especially music that I thought I didn't like. I would seek it out. You know, the way you seek out a new flavor, you know, something that, that, um, that first makes you uh, crush up your nose. Um, because I love I love that experience of, of discovery, but but now um, you know I was thinking the other day um, I do want to listen to some music again, but what do I want to hear right now? Um, I want to hear maybe two of them throat singing. I want to hear Tibetan monks um, chanting and, and 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 banging on drums and gongs. And uh, playing those long, those long trumpets. I want to hear a peyote chant with the with the with the drumming that just goes on and on and on and on and on and, on and, the, and the high keening uh, voice that just goes higher and higher and higher. Yeah, I want to hear I want to hear music that is somehow more more deeply connected to the earth and to what I call the real world than most of the music that comes from, from, from our culture. And most of all, I just, I just want to hear the birds, and, and I just want to listen to the wind on the mountain. And, you know, you use the, you use the word elemental, which is a word I use a lot. I have um, hundreds of hours of field recordings that I made in mostly in the 1980s and 90s um, in Alaska, all over Alaska. And um, we have recently redigitized those recordings, and I have them all now on a hard drive. And I don't know where this may lead me, but when I've been listening recently um, to, to recorded music, that's what I've been listening to. I've just been listening to glaciers cutting into the seas, thunder rolling over mountaintops, to candlelight tinkling in a in a whirlpool on the Yukon River, um, to the, to the wind across the tundra. You know, it remains to be heard where where this may lead me. But my thought is that I, uh, I, I it it may result in something. Um, something big in a form that I can't imagine yet, that it's something I've, I've never done before. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It's really been very inspiring to, you know, just go listen deeper after talking to you. So thank you. Well, uh, the pleasure is all mine. I, um, I thank you for what you're doing and, and, and for your, for your energy, for, for your love. These days we're all asking ourselves, what can I do? And, um, and you're doing something. And um, more power to you for that. Thanks for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, John. Have a good night. All right, yep. Take good care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.
The Wind is produced by me, Phil Corbett. The music in this episode was entirely by John Luther Adams. In order, pointed mountains scattered all around from Arctic Dreams, above Sunset Pass from The Wind in High Places, and this orchestral piece become desert. And I'd like to mention that this show was partially named after The Wind in High Places. I will link all of these at thewind.org. And lastly, this is one part of a two-part story. The other is called How to Build an Aeolian Harp. Make sure to check that one out too, and while you're at it, subscribe to the show. Thank you for being here, and keep listening.